What's up, SCS Nation? Welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor. 44 days and still no suspect, no person of interest, and no weapon to be found anywhere. But there are some developments in the case. And once again, we bring you the best guests in the business and two new faces on STS tonight. We love that. Lisa Daddio is a retired police lieutenant with the New Haven Police Department in Connecticut. She spent approximately 16 years in the detective division as a detective sergeant and then lieutenant uh, commanding the major crimes unit. She processed over 200 crime scenes ranging from vandalisms to homicides, which is what we're talking about tonight. She had one major high profile case I'll have her tell you about. And since retiring from the New Haven Police Department in 2012, she has worked in higher education, teaching courses at both the undergraduate and graduate level. The gentleman on the panel, other than me, Robin Dreek, welcome to the show. He's a best-selling author, a professional speaker, a trainer, an executive coach, a podcast host, a Marine Corps officer, and retired FBI special agent, and was chief of the Counterintelligence Behavior Analysis Program. So he has done it all. He is author of a couple of books, The Code of Trust, and a, mother, a book my mother would love to get about me called It's Not All About Me. She always says, don't make it all about you. So, Robin, great title. Um, some quick housekeeping notes. This podcast can be found anywhere you find podcasts, not just on YouTube. We're getting questions about that. So you can get it on Apple, on Audible, et cetera, et cetera. If you want to be uh, a part of the newsletter, drop your email in our comment section on YouTube. Patreon, we would love your support. Carmela, my mom, is doing a her first virtual meet and greet January 5th. Also follow us on Twitter, Insta, Facebook. And as my eight-year-old daughter says, because of the algorithm, please hit my father's like button. Now, uh, as you two know all too well, a lot of times these become whodunits. We forget the victims and who they actually are. So I like to start every show this way. Let us never forget those young lives lost way too soon. Madison Mogan, 21. Kaylee Gonzalez, 21, Zana Kernodal, 20, and Ethan Chapin, 20. May their memories be blessings. So in the spokesman review, uh, coming out of the gates here with some of the latest news, Ben Mogan, who's the father of Maddie Mogan, uh, spoke to the newspaper over the weekend and uh, came out and said that he has no doubt the Moscow PD are going to solve this quadruple homicide using biological and visual evidence. So, uh, Lisa, to you, do you concur with Ben Mogan and, and believe that uh, Moscow will solve this case? I, I do. Um, based upon the information that is currently out there, and we have to remember that they're only releasing bits and pieces. They're never going to show their entire hand. No police department, and especially a case that is just so horrific as this is going to show you everything. And so we only know a small piece of what they have. Evidence is an investigator's dream. That's what you hope for. The more evidence you have, the more likely you are to solve a case. Um, that's one piece of the puzzle. Obviously, if you have eyewitnesses or somebody who witnessed the crime and other pieces of it, digital evidence is a huge thing right now. Um, so, you know, you try to encompass all of that. And tips. You know, I know there's been tens of thousands of tips that have come in uh, as well. And as a law enforcement investigative agency, you have to run every single one of those down and either include them or not include them or exclude them, right, to help you kind of start putting together this case. And um, so Ben Mogan, the father again of Maddie Mogan, went on and said, uh, and I quote here, from the very beginning, I've known that people don't get away with these things these days. There's too many things that you can get caught up on, like DNA and videos everywhere. This isn't something that people get away with that goes unsolved. Uh, Robin, you've got a lot of time in the FBI. Uh, do you tend to agree with that? There's just too many channels, uh, too many ways for investigators these days to collect evidence does the perpetrator or perpetrators get caught eventually? I I agree with you and I agree with Lisa and I agree with the dad on that one wholeheartedly. Uh, it's not just me being optimistic, I don't think. But when you look at the violence involved in this crime and you look at the way it was committed, this is someone with a lot of intent and this is what predators do. 
and I was really thinking hard about that today as I have been the last bunch of days, the more of this is coming, you know, that we've been talking about it. And this is an individual, a predator that most likely this wasn't the first time they've done something like this, maybe against humans, it might be, but we don't know that. But predators also like to try to keep themselves safe. And believe it or not, I, I know some people get shocked by that, but they're looking out for their own well-being as well. They're going to take a path of least resistance. They're going to practice. They're going to have experience. They're going to escalate to the level of which this went. And hard to not think they weren't very contemplative about how they went about doing this. And in so doing, they're going to leave a trail. Let's hope so. Um, one of the interesting uh, sort of juxtapositions or dichotomies with this article in the Spokesman Review is um, Ben Mogan is clearly optimistic about the future uh, of this case, uh, apprehending the suspect or suspects. But we've seen Steve Gonzalez in the news a lot. Uh, I've had some guests on the show that have been a little controversial because uh, they've called out some of his behavior, talking to the media excessively. But he he basically said uh, that the cops were cowards. That's a direct quote. Um, and also referred to them as really inexperienced, even going so far as to hire a private uh, detective. Uh, so, Lisa, to you, I mean, this speaks a little bit about uh, just the level of distress that uh, victims' families can feel. Um and obviously he's reacting in a different manner, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, like, and it goes back to, we don't have all the information, right? What the police department has done and hasn't done. There's been a lot of miscommunication out there and statements put out there that, that do not help the police department and, and how they're kind of doing the investigation because of things they've said, right? And everyone is really hanging on to every single word that is coming out of, um, the Moscow Police Department and other officials, officials, you know, that know the ins and outs of the case. So that shines such a horrible light on the investigators. Um, you know, what's hard is no matter how much training you have, nothing prepares you for four people to have been slaughtered. Um, and, you know, we're dealing with a different age of everything with technology, uh, the capabilities of forensic evidence, uh, biological evidence, obviously. So, you know, but they have great resources and, and, you know, the state police are involved, the FBI are involved. You really can't get any better than that. Um, there may have been some mistakes in the beginning, but we're human. So there's always going to be little bleeps along the way. Um, I think it's important to be optimistic. And at the same time, from a victim's family perspective, no one is ever doing enough because right. they want the arrest made yesterday. And I could almost guarantee you the police department is not sharing all the information they have, even with the family, for a lot of different reasons. And so that only feeds into distrust, uh, anger, and comments like that, that, you know, they're over their head or that are negative in nature, because the father has every right to be devastated and angry about the whole thing. And Robin, you're an expert in behavior. That is your wheelhouse. Um, victims' families are going to—they're uh, going to mourn in different ways, right? Yeah, absolutely. And what Lisa's saying was completely spot on. What's going on here? Again, <laughs> you can't guess at what's going on in in a parent's head when something so tragic happens. But most likely, trust was lost, and trust is trust generally is lost when you have incongruence of information and behavior. The thing that builds trust is transparency, openness, congruence behind what you see, what you hear, and what you're doing. So all these things together build congruence, and congruence builds trust. Trust says everything's going fine. So what Lisa said is at the very beginning, especially, you had incongruent messages between what was going on, what's being presented by the media to the media. You have all these different theories that are going out there, which makes things look like mayhem can do to family and to others. And so when you have that incongruent messaging going on, you're, and then when you have the, the lead investigator on this has only four years in the force, even though he's leading this beautiful team of experience, it can look chaotic and it can. So to a parent that's grieving, you're going to say you're not doing enough and I need to do more so I can feel safe that you're doing all that you can so I can try to understand everything. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. 
And so again, we're coming off the uh, Christmas weekend. It was uh, very quiet, uh, kind of a somber feeling, I think nationwide, just because of the horrible weather on top of everything else uh, nationwide, even uh, here in Miami where I'm coming to you. So felt a little off this, uh, this holiday season. Um, over the weekend, uh, a gentleman named Cole Altenator spoke to ABC News. Um, he was a junior at the University of Idaho and lived in that exact house where the homicides took place on King Road. Um, and he had some interesting sound bites, as they say in the news business. And I quote here, he said, it's definitely an old creaky house. You can't walk up any of the stairs or any of the floors without everybody in the house knowing it. Um, and goes on to say, a lot of students are familiar with the inside of the home. He described the neighborhood in the house as having a very active party life, saying that during parties, people, people would hop the fence and just like walk away if the cops came. Um, I mean, Lisa, to you, pulling off a quadruple homicide is a, not an easy thing to do. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a, a difficult thing to, to, to take care of. Um, this house um, is creaking. The stairs are making noise. Does, from an investigative standpoint, does it make you a little more curious? Maybe why the other other people didn't react faster? Does it make you a second guess? Or what questions do you have, knowing the sort of house uh, that it is? Well, when I learned that there were survivors, right, because they're survivors in the home, I that was a major wow thing for me. Um, because I'm like, how did that happen? How did nobody wake up? Because it's not something I would think that you couldn't hear, right? Um, however, I do know that the survivors, you know, based on the information that's out there, were on the first floor, you know, um, the creaking, you got to take into account the hour of the, of the night or the morning that they came, all came home. Um, whether or not the other two survivors um, had been out previously and were they under the influence of any alcohol or anything at that point? Um, were they passed out? Did they have music playing a TV on where they didn't hear it? Um, and again, maybe you heard something in your sleep, but yet you didn't hear something in your sleep, like one of those kind of weird places that you're in. And, and to me, they would definitely be a focus of the investigation. And, and sometimes you know, you just want to go at their deep psyche on that to find out exactly, you know, are you sure you didn't hear anything? Um, I, 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 you know, the thought of four people being uh, killed and, and, and not all at the same time, really, because they weren't like if they were in one room together. That's something that I've been just like thinking over and over again, like, how did that happen? How did two victims get murdered and the other two initially did not and didn't hear anything. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things there, alcohol in their system, um, you know, that kind of stuff, which obviously the medical examiner knows and the autopsy results are gonna show that once, well, they should be back by now actually, the toxicology reports. Um, but all of that may have had an impact on why there were four victims instead of maybe two or one. Um, all part of the puzzle that you just really have to dig through. It's tough. It's tough. And Lisa, you covered um, you covered a very high profile case, a uh, Yale grad student. Just tell the audience briefly who she was and um, what it was like to work a case that, that was that high profile. So I know the pressure that are on investigators. I actually was the supervisor of the team that investigated the murder of Yale graduate student, Annie Lay. Um, Annie, for those of you that, that don't know, uh, she was a grad student at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, she was murdered and uh, stuffed into a wall by a animal technician. And she was actually in her research lab. That's a research building in Yale. So, you know, that was a building that was open to everybody. Our first thought was like, how did nobody not hear or see her getting killed uh, to death? And she was strangled to death and had some other pretty substantial injuries uh, as well. How did nobody hear it? How did nobody see it? 
And so, you know, we had to go through interviewing hundreds of people, just like Moscow, uh, looking for video surveillance. And what helped us solve that case, honestly, was key card access was part of it. The bigger part was DNA. Um, and, you know, we were able to get both Annie's DNA and the arrested and convicted killer, uh, Raymond Clark's DNA on several pieces of key evidence that were found. But that investigation, there were just like what's happening in Moscow, there was us, the Connecticut State Police and the FBI. So same type of situation, three different law enforcement agencies, three different everything, protocols, procedures, egos. Um, we all wanted to solve the case, and we, but we worked together seamlessly. Um, it, what, I wasn't over my head. I didn't feel that I was over my head. But what made the case so much more difficult was the media. They were camped out at the police department. They were camped out at the research lab. So much misinformation came out of that that was really hurting us on so many fronts that there was actually like a gag order placed on everybody um, because of the misinformation that was being said. And you're not going to stop reporters from doing what they do. And that's okay because they are also an ally to investigators. But at the same time, the pressure of that was pretty <clears throat> intense. I mean, we were lucky. We made an arrest in that case in like nine days, which is really at the beginning, I didn't think was going to be possible. Mm -hmm. um, but we knew it happened in a building that's secure. So it had to be somebody that worked there, except there's hundreds of people that work there. Mm -hmm. So it's ruling out all of that um, and taking into account, just like one of the victim's dad said, biological and, and digital electronic evidence is gonna help. So uh, you were saying you work with the same, you work with state and federal authorities on that? Um, so I how, did, yeah. Yeah, so how did you, um, cause you know, part of uh, the rub against the Moscow police department is that, you know, that they, they don't really have their m messaging uh, straight. And one of the guests I just had on talked about the importance of optics to show that you know what you're doing, even though they might know what they're doing, but it comes off like they don't. So how did you guys kind of uh, coordinate to make sure your messaging was on point? So we, the New Haven Police Department, had been the only point of, of meeting with the media on a regular basis. Um, at the time, our chief of police, James Lewis, who's phenomenal, um, actually, I mean, he was the perfect package in, in a lot of different ways. So he only would release what we had given him to release, knowing that you had to feed something, right? And so we did it, but we made sure, because if you don't put the information out there and you don't put it out there accurately, the media is going to run with it. So you can't ignore the media and not say, hey, we're not going to say anything, no comment. That's not going to work in a high profile case like this, ever. So just come together. Somebody's got to take the lead of what's being released. Um, different agencies are going to decide who that is. You know, when we had the massacre at Sandy Hook, you know, the Connecticut State Police were the, the lead on that. And, you know, now retired Paul Vance, you know, was phenomenal with the media on that case. And, and so you have to have a figurehead that kind of reeks of confidence so that it's portray that your whole agency is that confident. And, and so I think, you know, whoever that is, whether it's with the state police, the FBI or Moscow, somebody has got to just really grab a hold of it and, and start messaging it the right way. So we're talking a, a big difference. So you, you guys saw that case in nine days. We're on 44 days here. We'll get back to that in a little bit, but uh, something in the behavioral realm for uh, Robin. So uh, another guest who we've had on this show, uh, and again, we do have the best guest, as you can tell right now, by these two. Uh, we've had Jennifer Koffendoffer on, a uh, former FBI special agent, and she spoke to Newsweek magazine and uh, talked about the possibility, Robin, of femicide, which is defined as the intentional murder of women simply because they are women. Um, investigators on the case, she says, this is Koffendoffer are looking at everyone associated with each victim, starting with their families and inner circles. Because it hasn't been solved yet, this is a quote, I believe they're past the inner circles of these individuals. Perhaps it is more of an outlying individual. Um, and she goes on to talk about incels uh, that we've discussed on the show, 
who are basically uh, involuntary uh, celibates. So, Robin, what do you make of this? Um, I guess a two-parter, uh, and it's I know it's tough to uh, to answer, but do you think we are past this quote-unquote inner circle, and do you think it could be someone who basically hates women? I agree that, yeah, we're beyond the inner circle, most likely. I mean, we're still all guessing at this, but we're probably – because they're they're – just expanding that 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 sphere of influence around these individuals and, and cascading outward from there, given against again the violence in which this happened, the the intense and also the venue. You know, as Lisa was saying, for two other people not to wake up during this, I look at it as someone who actually knew exactly the house they wanted to target. Because it, the people inside and people around were desensitized towards high volume, high noise, and all the things that would alert someone who lived in a calm house. And so I think that was part of this as well. So I think it's definitely, as everyone's saying, is beyond that inner circle, but someone who is close enough and aware enough of, of, of the, the site and the venue that they were choosing in which to do this. That's an interesting point. Um, I guess – College kids are desensitized to uh, a lot in a lot of ways. They're walking yeah. around with their headphones, but uh, especially in a house that is uh, that loud with that many people going in and out, you know, something that you or I uh, would typically be alerted to, um, they may not. So, uh, and, 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 I, and I apologize. And as you all said, you know, all the creaking of the boards going up and downstairs and the time of day in someone else's house, I would be out within seconds saying what is going on here it wasn't when whether people are induced or not induced or under influence of anything it still was not alerting to anyone in that house or anyone around as well so that just tells me a lot about an assumed behavior that they're used to and for those who did not catch it robin dreek recruited spies this guy so this guy's got to know human behavior because he's not recruiting bad guys he's recruiting the most important people to catch the bad guys so on to the last little bit of uh, news from over the weekend um so we've all heard the name jack de Kerr. he is uh Kay kaylee gonzalez's on again off again boyfriend the one who all those calls went out to the night of the murder well um brooke miller who is, I believe, the aunt. Uh, yeah, it's Jack's aunt. She spoke to the New York Post over the weekend and basically says that he has just been left absolutely devastated by the loss of, quote unquote, the love of his life and the subsequent harassment um, he has experienced from online sleuths. A lot of people who, you know, write to me and send me emails saying who they think did it. Um, so, Back to you, Robin, for a minute, because you're on the behavioral side of things. Um, I mean, obviously, a very high profile case. This person was very close to Kaylee, the on again, off again boyfriend. I mean, it's sort of inevitable that people are going to point their finger at him, and they still are um, justified or not justified or just human nature. So, yeah, people are going to look for quick answers and easy answers. I, I see a lot of it. What I'd be looking for, whether it's this individual, or any other individual is, as we said earlier on, this is going to be a pattern in their life and a pattern of being a predator. And so beyond looking at this and looking at him and his connection, what other things has, has he done throughout his life that would be congruent with this kind of behavior? And if you don't see anything, that's probably why they're ruling him out because there's, <laughs> if he's displayed a natural empathy towards anyone or anything without provocation and just as a human being incapable. Interesting. This is another direct quote from the aunt Brooke Miller, Jack DeKerr's aunt, which by the way, he lives in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So some people were wondering if his name is very similar, if he had any relation to some of the uh, founders of that town in Idaho. But this quote is, there are just ridiculous conspiracy theories. He's not only lost the love of his life, this is Jack DeKerr meeting Kaylee, and what we all thought, and he probably thought as well, would be his future wife, you know, get married, have kids, and all that. Um, so to you, Lisa, again, sometimes it's easy to jump on people who you assume are close to uh, a victim, but 
do we all as a collective group have to take a uh, kind of a deep breath and um, not assume the worst, especially potentially about a 20 or 21 year old college kid who finds himself in, in, the, in the middle of all this? So yeah, you do. Um, but at the same time, in the initial stages, you have to rule people in or rule them out. And so given what we know um, on his relationship with one of the victims and, and kind of a little bit deeper, you know, you have to think that maybe he is involved. Um, and we see that, and in, in even with the Annie Lay case, initially, when we got involved in this, she was a missing person. Um, it wasn't that, oh, we had a crime scene. No, she was missing. And, you know, we, we went back and, and we kind of retraced steps, uh, her steps, I mean, and looked at video and, and all this other stuff. And we realized that she didn't, never left the building. But initially, her fiance was possibly involved in this. You know, it, it was on the weekend that she was supposed to get married. Like, everything was aligned, but we couldn't focus in on that. And so, like, we talk a lot in the investigative world on getting, you know, um, tunnel vision, tunnel vision. Thank <laughs> you. Yes. And so even in this case, you can't do that. Um, and you have to, re you know, totally remain open minded on this whole thing. But it's not easy, especially if there's something there that's nagging you about a particular person that you have to rule in or rule out. And so you leave them kind of in this middle place until you can find something um, or you have something to back up why they're excluded or included. And so, you know, it's tough. And you're gonna, you're gonna look at those closest, especially this crime. It was violent, it was personal. Uh, it's kind of what we know already when we think about um, these types of really brutal deaths that it was personal in nature. But yet you have to say, well, then why four of them? You know, so maybe you can say two because they were in the same bed together. But then why go into the other room and, and murder the other two? Like that doesn't make sense to me if it was a crime of passion. And what about the two that were spared? Any thoughts on that, Lisa? Location? Um, you know, they're on the first floor. But then again, the other side of me saying, why are you going upstairs unless you were targeting one of the four victims? You know, I don't know. I mean, that probably is more of a question for Robin thinking about the psychological side of it. Um, I would have thought if it was a, a, an act of violence or a random act of violence, you're going to start at the first floor, but they didn't. They started upstairs. So, you know, we're talking about Jack Decor, and I don't want to, I, I really don't want to single in on a, on a person, mm -hmm. but there was a story written about him and the aunt commenting. So I think it's fair game, at least for today. But, you know, I look at him, Robin, and, um, you know, I meek is probably not the right word, maybe a little nerdy, redhead. You, you know, you just look at him. He looks like a shy guy, very slight build. Um, so in my head right away, I'm saying, no way, you know, not possible. And I'm going to leave the investigation up to the investigators. But the the reason I'm bringing it up, the point is, you can't really judge a killer by a book cover, right, Robin? Um, killers come in all shapes, sizes, colors, creeds, nationalities, right? I mean, it's tough to look at someone and say yes or no, this guy's a killer. No doubt. The, <laughs> if you were to do that with spies I've recruited, you we, you would never have guessed the ones we actually recruited were the ones that you were thought the most hardcore, staunch supporters of their regimes, and they wound up coming over to our side. So what lies deep dark inside of some people you just never know but going back to the violence of this that we we're saying this was and kind of what lisa was talking about too so we have four people that were murdered and they're murdered with a a, a straight a, a you know a non-foldable knife a straight edge knife that physically is very difficult and so you plan on two you go with four might not even been physically capable of doing more because of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is a this is a an exhausting cardiovascular event, and I, I'm so sorry to to make it sound so as you know, you know, as 
aesthetic like that, but it, it really, that's what really was at the root of it. And so then you actually have to look at it. It wasn't like someone took a gun and pulled the trigger. This is actually a physical, a violent physical event that was emotional, although less so if we're dealing up with psychopathy, obviously, but predators don't. But it's a physical event that took a lot of energy for someone to perpetrate, and we don't know how long it took either. Um, right. We don't know the amount that they fought back. We know there was some fighting back. And so that is an exhaustive event. So the other two we might not have even been capable of it. And there was a lot of talk um, initially. Again, Steve Gonzalez says he got a report from the coroner, which a lot of people had an issue with to begin with, talking about how Kaylee's injuries, and this goes back a couple of, of weeks, but Kaylee's injuries were much worse than Maddie's injuries that he described them as these big open gouges. Uh, and right. some people say, to your point, that maybe they got to Maddie later and were just too tired. But Lisa, I'm curious, so this has come up quite a bit. What about the fact that allegedly, I mean, the, the coroner told the family members details of these wounds. That can be very problematic. And she also spoke um, quite, you know, quite a bit to the media when a lot of people say that she shouldn't have. I'm curious what your takes are when, because a coroner is a different jurisdiction, right? But uh, you want to make sure they're not revealing information that's pertinent to the investigation, right? You know, so I'm always one of those. So uh, this is going to be a tough one. And, and I am of the family deserves as much information as we have on the medical side. They're, they're entitled to the report. They're going to get the report anyway. So they're going to read it now. Are they going to understand some of the language, the medical language that's in there? Probably not. But Google, right? So, you know, I think that there has to be full transparency with the family. They deserve it. Um. I, on, on the fact that she spoke to the media, I'm totally against um, for a lot of reasons. Some of that information probably uh, should not have been released and it should have been only available to the investigators because they too will get the medical examiner report. And so they may not have wanted all of that out. And what's the point of it? Unless you're sensationalizing it, which drives me crazy. You know, four kids are dead. A town is in panic, rightfully so. A college campus is in panic, rightfully so. And yet you're giving details that are horrific. Um, and to me, it's sensationalizing it. And, and why? There, there's no reason for it. And coordinate. If anything, if you want to give a statement because of your office, and again, every state is different as to what the medical examiners or coroners release, work with the law enforcement agencies and do a joint press conference. And talk ahead of time, plan ahead of time on what you're going to release so that everybody's on the same page. Always remembering the family. And sometimes as investigators, we really stink at that um, because we're so consumed with the investigation. We want to make an arrest that we don't do as good of a job relaying parts of the investigation. And they may think they're not doing a good enough job, they meeting the family. Um, so there's a fine line there as well uh, as to what you can tell them. It's interesting. We had a uh, detective sergeant retired Chris Anderson from the Birmingham Police Department who was on the show First 48. Uh, and I believe he's investigated over 300 homicides, maybe 400. Talked about He talked about the difficulty of, you know, how much he wants to be in close contact with the victim's families, but how difficult it is when you're investigating and the time consumption. So he's talking about the constant kind of tug of war there. We did get a question that I love from a viewer um, last week, which I'll pose to you. And that is, ask your experts, you guys, what is the one, in, one question you would have for investigators right now? Robin, is there one? What I have for investigators? Yeah, if you could ask them one thing right now. I ask them how the tempo is going, probably, you know, is the tempo still as, as high speed as it was at the beginning or is it slowing down? I'm just curious about the tempo for them. You know, are they getting enough in? Are they making enough progress? Is the, how's the energy level right now? Is How's the motivation? Because it's their motivation. It's their positivity uh, and optimism that's going to keep this thing moving forward. So I'd go, I'd go there first. Lisa? I'm thinking differently. I'm thinking like an investigator. So as an outsider, I want to know exactly what they've done and what type of information and, and evidence they have and to make sure that, in fact, they've looked for it, especially 
cell phones um, and, and towers and cast reports by the FBI, yep, yep, yep. Um, <laughs> focusing in on that location. I mean, so that's a key. And, I, and I'm not saying they didn't do that, but I'm going to go back to the investigation because sometimes you're so deep in it, you assume it was done or somebody else did it and it was never done. And so I'm going to focus in on, on that type of stuff right now. And we had a uh, retired detective Phil Waters from the Houston Police Department on, who I believe uh, investigated 500 homicides or at least 400, somewhere in there. Um, and he wanted to know if they uh, lifted all the grates on the streets looking for the uh, potential fixed blade weapon. Uh, Lisa, that is uh, truly the mind of a detective, right? Absolutely. And, and so for me, you know, the first thing I was reading is they were saying that they had done some of the dumpsters or something and, and there was nothing evidentiary found in there. I'm like, well, did you look in the bushes? Did you look in the storm drains? And you have to go out blocks, 360 degrees. Did you look in all the yards? Did you look under brush? Um, and again, you know, it's not too late. So if they haven't done it and anybody's listening, go back and do it because um, it's still there. If in fact it was discarded, um, multiple times we've pulled storm drains. We got public works out with us. They sucked up the water and we found guns and everything that were related to homicides uh, in New Haven. So, you know, it's definitely garbage cans is another example. You know, did you look at all the garbage cans that were in people's yards or the street all surrounding blocks each way? Because you don't know. And then you're also going to want to look at videos and traffic cams and everything else um, to see if somebody did take a car and, and, you know, or did use a car, I should say, did they stop after the murder and did they discard anything along the way? So, I mean, it, it's a massive undertaking, but go back to the fundamentals of an investigation, kind of like, you know, knocking on the doors and doing those neighborhood canvases, as we say, put the boot to the pavement. And, and going back to that storm drains, garbage cans, dumpster, a dumpsters, brush, looking for evidence. So I am, uh, I've said this before, and I'll say it probably a million more times. I'm the son of a retired psychiatrist and the son of a social worker. So I'm always curious about the psychology. So Robin, how in the world did you get into the business of recruiting spies? How did that, how did that evolve without telling us names? <laughs> No, that was easy. I, I failed at being an astronaut. <laughs> Is that what you, you wanted to be an astronaut? Yeah, when I was younger, then I didn't have I, – I, you don't let someone who had to take the SAT seven times get in the Naval Academy, major in aerospace engineering. That was just a disaster. Um, so I go Marine Corps, and then we had a recruit, recruiter from the FBI came to Paris Island where I was a serious commander, company commander down there. He said, I think F, I think Marine officers make great FBI agents. I go, what What do I even do? I mean, I, I was totally close. I got assigned to New York City, and, and I – I bumped into some great people. I had some great timing and they were all former military and they said, we recruit spies. They said, that sounds really cool. And there it just got forged. But you, uh, you belittle <laughs> yourself a little bit, but I mean, were you interested in uh, the human beha human behavior, human psychology? And did you have like uh, an inclination to go in that direction once you knew it was an option? Um, you know, I got exposed in one of my cases early on. I, we, I was told that, Hey, we have this, you know, it was a, a recruitment case. And we said, Hey, we have this FBI behavioral team for counterintelligence that comes and helps strategize the operation. And I called them in on my case. And they, these folks came in with a, one of our operational psychologists. Matter of fact, um, the guy that was on uh, the news nation with me the other night, Dr. Chris Mahandi, um, we worked together on the team. He was on my team and they came in and they did this really cool job of strategizing the human interaction and understanding the motivations of all human beings. And what everyone's looking for is trust. They want to feel safe. And what are you going to do to make them feel safe? Because that's the underlying human behavior of everyone is a feeling of safety and security. And so even when you're dealing with a predator, kind of circling back to this, they're going to do what they need to do for their psychological well-being as, as twisted as they are as predators, but they're always still going to do everything they can do to be safe when they do it because they want to do it again. You know, I mean, just think of a wolf. A wolf's not going after, you know, the, the the alpha male of the deer. He's going for the slowest one. He's going for what he can get. And so that's what these people are doing. So that's where you're looking. It's so interesting because we had, again, Phil Waters, who's a legend. He does not like that term being used, but I will when he's not on air. But 
Um, there was a show made about him called The Interrogator. And he said, look, I don't even like that name because I don't interrogate. It's got a negative right. connotation. But he says that everything in this world is a relationship. From the moment the doctor pats you on the butt and says, welcome to the world. So he he says he goes into every interrogation or interview uh, and he builds the relationship. I'm curious, Lisa, if that's your approach, um, especially in trying to get uh, a suspect to confess. Absolutely. Um, so what you want to do, and sometimes you don't have the leisure of doing it, you always want to make sure that whoever you select to do the, and I'm with him on this, I also don't like the term interrogation because of the negative connotations, but it is an interrogation. It's not an interview. <laughs> um, you really want to use somebody who uh, knows as much information as they can about the person they are interrogating and also can somehow relate and, and develop a rapport with that person so that that person um, talks to them. And that's what it is. You have to build a relationship. You can't just go in there and say, hey, tell me about the, you know, in this case, the four people you murdered. You know, it's just not going to work. And then you also have to know who's going to be the better interrogator. Is it going to be a male? Is it going to be a female? You know, kind of as much information as you can get about the person you're about to interrogate, then you pick the interrogator to get that information. Um, you have excellent ones and you have ones that are terrible at it and should never interrogate anybody. Human nature, you have to have gift of the gab. Uh, every agency knows who those people are um, who can literally sit down and get somebody to confess after however long it takes. Um, because they can develop a rapport and they appear sincere and listening and, and whatever skills you need to use to get that person to trust you and to talk to you. And Rob, you talked about uh, the wolf not going after the alpha mm -hmm. deer, but um, I'm curious, do you think that whoever committed this, uh, these killings wants to kill again? Is it your assumption that that's the case? Predators will be predators. You know, it, it, it's, they're going to get their satisfaction in some way. It just, it, it's their nature. And you, so you don't think this was a case of, uh, you know, a rage killing. Someone was super upset, did what they had to do, maybe had some collateral damage. I hate to use that term and they're done, but you think this person would want more from uh, basically using the term profiling the case so far? You know, it's not my area. But when you look at, again, you just look at the way this was conducted, the extreme violence this took, the personalization of using a fixed blade to do this multiple times, that is the level of intensity and ferocity there is pretty profound to me. And it's hard to imagine that once they've had that experience as a predator, it's going to be hard to go back to anything else. But again, we don't know all the details. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I get I'm um, getting a lot of uh, interesting emails, some horrible comments, but mostly good ones. And uh, I got one from today from a professor who studies obsessive compulsive behavior in people who have a proclivity to kill and uh, working to get her on uh, a very, very interesting psychology. Um, you know, some people have the obsession to keep their shoes in perfect order or their closet perfectly neat. Other people, their OCD goes down a, uh, a dark path. So um, one other big question for the two of you, and then if you will indulge some uh, viewer questions and comments, but the big overarching question, Lisa, to you first, it's 40 plus days right now. What is next? See, it's tough. That's a tough one, only because we don't know all the information, right? So there can be a lot there that we don't know, nor should we know it. Um, we have to trust the investigators and you have three major agencies working on this. So um, I, I think for everybody, be patient. Don't think that something isn't important or that, um, oh, I'm sure they know this already. When in doubt, just let them know um, because maybe somebody else didn't know that. Or, you know, like I always think that somebody knows something that they can tell the investigators whether maybe they want to get involved, maybe they don't. Um, it's definitely still ongoing, obviously. 
and more information keeps coming in, which at sometimes is a blessing and a curse at the same time, but it's better than nothing coming in. And, and so that's going to be the key right here. And uh, Robin, same to you. I mean, 40 plus days, wh what are you looking for next? Maybe from a uh, behavioral standpoint. I'm going to hit two things. I totally agree with what Lisa said with the cell phone analysis, because there's a lot of that data to go through. I'm imagining they're be able to really sift that down more and more right now. That's going to be very telling. And the other thing is, and this is what the chief said, um, is he asked the public be diligent. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to understand what diligence is and what it's not. What's really helpful is when People are present. I've said this numerous times, being present and observing and observing things that have changed. What's not helpful is when people are being diligent where they think I'm looking for a killer because they are using their own confirmation bias on what they think a killer looks like. Then you're going to miss everything else. And so being present and observing things that are different and have changed is on the behavioral side is what I'm looking for all the time. Can you give an example of that, what you mean by that? Of which the presence or difference <laughs> yeah, noticing a difference in behavior. Yeah. yeah. Well, let, we just, I'll use confirmation bias for one thing. So if someone, and we all get this and I'm sure you've talked about in your show is if, if someone says I can detect deception, I'm going to use nonverbal behavior to de detect deception. They're going to look for cues that are going to show deception. They're going to miss all the clues that are showing veracity and truth because they're mm -hmm. looking for one thing that they've, that they've given themselves, as you said earlier, the tunnel vision on. Mm -hmm. In order to be present and really truly observe, you have to do your best to let go of the tunnel vision, observe and be present with everything you're seeing around you and be curious about everything. Was that always like that? Was this always here? Was this person always like this? Were these statements congruent? So you're looking for congruence of your environment, which is the sameness. And when things deviate from that sameness of things you've already seen, that's where you zero in and ask questions. You don't assume what it is. You don't assume what it means. You don't say we got a killer or don't have a killer. You say this looks a little different. What's that mean? And that's what you turn in. So keeping a total open mind and looking for change within that open space. Absolutely. That's a great way to put it. Thank you. <laughs> and you know something else I, I honestly literally just thought of um, when, you know, to kind of go back to that question that you just asked is, and maybe they did this, maybe they didn't. I would reach out to clinics, doctor's offices and hospitals to see if anybody within a day or two after the murders were treated and needed stitches from being injured during the assault. What kind of radius in for the hospitals? How far out would you look? I would do the whole state. Um, it's not a tough thing. They can look up to see if anybody came in and needed stitches. The person didn't leave the crime scene clean. They had to have so much biological and physical evidence on them. And probably some injuries. That I mean, that's, one of, that's one of the stitches. huge mysteries is people are like, where's the blood trail leaving the house? And unless we, you know, no. So blood trails are one of those things that is really difficult unless it was saturated. And so clothing is very absorbent. And so there may not be that quote blood trail that we're thinking would be there if the clothing is acting as a sponge. Or a and then you would need a lot of it. And that's where the forensic side of me kicks in because I have both the investigative and the forensic side. So like I know what clothing does, especially depending on what you're wearing, jeans and heavier clothing really absorb all that biological evidence where you're not going to see the blood trail. But Lisa, you don't think there's any way that this perpetrator left unscathed from that scene? I don't. Based upon what we know, I don't see how it's possible. Let's Again, back to what Robin had said regarding just the physical exertion and everything. How did they not get injured during the, you know, during the act of four different slaughters? That's the only way to describe it. I know it's right. pretty graphic, but that's what it is. It, it seems next to impossible. So let, let's move on to some viewer questions and comments. We've got a bunch and I'd love to get through them because we've got the STS Nation, the best uh, audience in the biz. Um First one comes from a user with a gazillion letters afterwards. Uh, this person writes, I have not heard anyone comment on the surrounding homeowners, not students in rentals, but actual homeowners. I'd like to know which homeowners called the police to that house with noise complaints 
It sounds like the cops were constantly called to that house with noise complaints, and I doubt it was students complaining of loud parties at the house. Was there a particular homeowner that made numerous complaints? Lisa, you're the investigator. Would you be checking out all these homeowners and all these complaints that apparently did come in? 100%, and that's probably done within the first few weeks of the investigation. I'm gonna say within the first few days, but um, you have to do that. You're gonna pull up all of that and you're gonna go knocking door to door back to that basic investigative steps. Lisa, what's it like for you when you're working a case the first day or two uh, and beyond? I mean, are you, is your mind just in it a thousand percent? You have trouble going to sleep? Do you have trouble concentrating on anything else? Yes and yes. And, and, and you don't sleep. Um, the adrenaline going is nonstop um, for days. If you're constantly being fed information and, and you're getting information that helps put the case together and you're talking to people and you're doing, you know, knocking on doors, the more stuff coming in, the more amped up you are. Because you want to make that arrest quickly. Um, you know, the 48 hours is always the term that we use um, realistically, it doesn't happen as often as 48 hours as we would like, but you're acting on pure adrenaline. There's no doubt in my mind, every investigator that's worked in this case hasn't slept much over the past 44 days because they wanna make the arrest um, for a lot of different reasons. And the images and the families and everything is haunting them. Um, they wanna get closure for everybody, but at the same time, build a strong enough case so they're gonna get a conviction. You don't ever want somebody to walk on this because of a, a mistake made along the way. In no way am I trying to compare myself to law enforcement, but same deal with uh, covering big stories. That was without question the hardest thing for me when I left uh, Fox News was just descending into the stratosphere of a m major news story. The adrenaline is is going a million miles an hour. You want to get the information out there. You want to get the info. So uh I can relate in some ways. The next comment comes from Mickey O'Shea, who uh, always has some good questions. And he says, will you ask the next panel? So I'll ask Robin, because this is sort of in your wheelhouse here. What criteria would have to be met for the FBI to take over a case without being asked to do so by the local agency? Because right now we know the FBI has to be invited in. Robin? It's okay to say, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I can't. And, and you know, Lisa would know this better than I. She worked with us at that level more than I did. I can't think of any case where we would take over. Um, it just, it just doesn't happen. That's I mean, right. why would, yeah, I mean, we, we were a tool. I mean, I was a screwdriver, you know, for, for whatever someone needed. I always looked at us, everyone else's, you know, that, that, that great young, young officer out there that's the lead on this. He's got he's got a big toolbox and a lot of screwdrivers. That's the only way I always look at it. And Robin's 100 percent right. Um, <laughs> first of all, there's not a federal crime. Um, yep. And so that's the big thing. Right. Um, I will tell you with 100 percent certainty, the FBI is amazing as a resource with so much tools that they can bring and analysts and you name it, where it helps the local investigators. So, I mean, they're, we've invited, we've had FBI agents work with us on multiple cases in the past, but it's, they're a support uh, to the agency because there's no federal crime that was committed. And we always hear about the famed FBI forensics lab. They say there is none better in the world. Uh, this one, I think, Robin, is for you, and it comes from Strawberry Nita. It is so interesting to me what could drive the killer to come to the conclusion that this murder was the only thing they could do to solve whatever triggered them. Mm. I go back and forth thinking it might've just been luck and it all being heavily planned with the amount of blood and the potential lack of screams. Could the killer have used something like chloroform and let the bodies bleed out? So there's kind of two questions, but the first one to me is the more interesting one. Um, is this the only conclusion the killer could have come to that I had to kill? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean tell, tell me about the mind of a killer. I mean, we don't they, think like a killer, so it's hard for us to understand, right? They, they've been victimized and wronged, and this is the only way it's going to right the wrong. And it's all about retribution. It's all about getting that out. It, it's, it's, it's their pleasure center. It's how they're gaining pleasure and rewarding their brain. And this is, this is it. You know, a lot of, a lot of 
predators out there will, and we're surrounded by them all the time, not to scare anyone, but, you know, people that take advantage of old people uh, and their money, um, the, you know, bad girlfriends and bad boyfriends, you know, there's a lot of predators around us and they enact that, that need in a lot of different ways. So at the primal level, was there other ways in which this person could get out this frustration? Absolutely. That's what healthy people do <laughs> when, when they feel wronged. You know, but when you start let, edging up towards this level of predatory behavior, um, obviously not because using a firearm is or another way of killing like chloroform where there's a lot less personalization. You could see that, but this was so deeply personal and so le so deeply violent. It is that's the that's the part that strikes me the most on this because it wasn't just once and and oops, you know, with a fixed blade. This took a lot of work, as we said earlier, and it's too graphic to think about. But it really uh, hard to imagine this person doing anything but what they did. This is where I get a little confused and tripped up. Let's say this was a serial killer. Um, do serial killers get personal? in their victimization or are they just getting off on the thrill and then do you assume are you saying that you assume this is not a serial killer then not my area of expertise with serial killers <laughs> yeah. um but you know that <laughs> there's I, uh, so when let, let's just use the, use the analogy i used earlier so if you have a wolf that's hunting a pack Mm -hmm. And wolves hunt for sport sometimes, as as we've known as evidence in in in, in society. You, it's not that they're going to necessarily go after only one gazelle; they're going to go after the gazelle that's easiest for them to get. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, there's a probability here that this wasn't personal, but it was personal from the standpoint of gender, maybe personal from the standpoint of of groups i mean there's a lot of things we don't know that the investigators are doing but this was this was something that the predator was able to target that made them feel safe because of um traffic in the house the time of day they had a lot of access to information allowed them to hunt in a horrible way very effectively and that's a good distinction and that's what jennifer Koffendoffer of the fbi was saying that maybe it was someone who committed femicide because they just hated women right. but uh, i'm curious lisa from your standpoint what about uh this chloroform notion because a lot of people say why didn't they scream you know why wasn't there noise is it possible these victims were chloroformed or, or put under some other drug i mean i guess anything's possible right um I would go back to how many murders were committed where victims were given chloroform. Um, <laughs> and there's not that many, right. Um, I, that I know of. And, and again, how would you know that uh, unless it was tested and it came through the autopsy by something? I mean, there's no way to really know that we don't know a hundred percent. There could have been yells and screams. We don't know that. We know that the house is busy. We know that there's been noise complaints. We know that, you know, there's a lot of movement going, you know, in and out of that house, but the, the four victims on that floor are the only ones that know, and the downstairs survivors, you know, they didn't hear it, but again, you know, it, it's a tough thing. We don't know a lot of it. Um, I don't know about chloroform, though. I don't. If, if see me, I'm thinking, and I have no expertise in this at all, if the suspect went there with chloroform and we know he went there or she went there with a knife that it was organized. It was pre-planned. It was premeditated. I mean, chloroform is a really interesting um, way to go about knocking four people out. It's like you say though, it's, it sounds like something that's more in the movies than possibly in reality. Uh, curious Lisa to get your take on this. So the local Moscow police department has been, you know, as we talked about criticized, but Brian Etten and News Nation asked uh, the chief the other day if it's possible that the uh, suspect is still in Moscow or in the surrounding area. And he gave an answer. He said, we're not disclosing that. And some of some of it we might not know yet. This person wrote, it's a great noncommittal. That means that maybe they have an idea. Maybe they don't have an idea. The killer can hear this and feel relaxed. And I wonder if that is maybe what they want. So. There are times when the police, you, are intentionally, um, maybe intentionally 
confusing in your answer to try to draw out a potential suspect. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you can. Um, I think sometimes what happens is it causes more issues and the public is, is reacting to that and, and misinformation or not confidence in the Moscow Police Department because of statements like that. Um, but if they had looked a little deeper, it's not unusual for whoever uh, the person is speaking on this on a continual basis is going to say something like that in order for the reasons that you just said. Um, you don't know, you know, right? Is it a serial killer? Is it not a serial killer? Is it somebody that lives in the town? Is it not somebody that lives in the town? I mean, you just don't know, or they may know um, or have a suspect pool, but they're not going to show that or tell that to anybody because it's too premature at this stage based upon the information we know. On to T-Bird. Um, what hasn't been talked about a lot is the initial call about an unconscious person and the mm -hmm. phone being passed around in the home during the 911 call. Did the roommates call friends before calling 911? And did they say there was an unconscious person when they called 911? Who was the phone passed around to? Doesn't appear there were bloody footprints outside the home. So did the killer bring a change of clothes and shoes or was the killer still in the house? These are a lot of questions, but there is a lot of talk, Lisa, um, of, you know, the, the crime happened uh, in the wee morning hours. And then the 911 call doesn't happen until like 1159 uh, in the morning the next day, if I'm correct about that exact time. Um, and apparently, you know, there's a crazy amount of blood. It's obvious that these victims were dead and there's all kinds of confusion what do you make about uh, those 911 calls about, you know, this unconscious uh, victim? Again, I, I think that that information probably shouldn't have gotten out. And that's my personal feeling because it's causing a lot of questions. It raised a question to me. I'm like, how it, unconscious and who called, right? And, it, and it's none of my business, um, really, who did it. So I think maybe that part of it in the beginning stages could have been handled a little bit different. And it's not criticizing Moscow because they're going through a lot and they're faced with this. The media is out there, you know, things are incredibly chaotic. And so you want to say something, but the other side of that too, depending on what you say, and they probably wouldn't be able to get it, but you can FOI. Uh, information, but every state is different. If it's an ongoing investigation, you'll never get that information while it's ongoing. But say something that a 911 call came in from whomever and leave it at that. Because to say it was an unconscious person where that's probably not accurate, um, and given what we know about the injuries on the victims and, and just how horrific the scene had to be. But that person, whoever called, is in full trauma uh, at what they're seeing. And so, again, this will go back more, um, you know, to Robin as to what whoever that caller was, how they're processing this. Um, and Robin, and that's the, yeah, that's a great lead in. So they're going to go back and examine, obviously, and listen to these 911 tapes as a behavioral expert. Um, what are you listening for um, to kind of gauge either authenticity or or inauthenticity? or someone potentially lying on a 911 call, what would jump out to you? I, I I think the way it was described is probably pretty much spot on with authentic. I mean, Lisa just said it right there. This person that called it in is in trauma. I mean, when was the last time anyone's seen that? You know, and the fact that they didn't assume that was person was dead, that they said someone's unconscious, if that was actually the statement, that's pretty congruent with someone who's not knowing someone's dead, especially if you've never seen a dead body. And especially if you're in a, in a place where people typically don't call cops first when things go sideways because they're used to things going sideways a lot with the police because of calls being made before. So their first, re their first inclination from behavior, from learned repetition is not to call police. It's call a friend to fix the problem. And they, I think they were sh Again, boy, what a supposition might be might have been overwhelmed with what they saw and didn't actually understand what they saw. And there's a term for it in battle, and that is the fog of war here. Absolutely. The fog of finding out that uh, your roommates have been murdered. Um, Sabrina Lennox, 
Uh, this one goes back to you, Robin. Uh, law enforcement and FBI have four victims, and that means extensive diving into four people's social circles. That, that's got to be more time consuming than usual. So now we're we're not dealing with one victim, but four victims, and therefore the behavior of so many more people attached to those four victims, meaning, you know, inner uh, family circle members, et cetera, et cetera. So how much more challenging does it become uh, exponentially having four victims and having to go through all that material? It's exactly it. It's exponential. I, I can't even imagine when I saw, the, especially the number of people that are conducting interviews, that's not even enough. You can't, but at the same time, you need someone who really knows how to conduct interviews to do a good job on this, to again, establish that baseline of what this, help this person identify when you're doing interviews, what deviated from what they normally see with, with engaging with anyone, any place, anything, and that entire concentric circle as it's expanding, especially because social media and all the digital technology we have is a great help. But it's also a great hindrance at the same time because it has compounded the number of contacts these people have had, especially in the college community. So it's it's a huge, huge endeavor they're going through. And we've talked about that the uh, you know the just the amazing capabilities of technology these days makes it both easier and a lot tougher at the same time. This no comment comes from Jacqueline Jansen's. Um, and this one, Lisa, is for you. There has to be two that went in there to kill him right away. Get it out fast. It's creepy, but I do believe there's two killers. I don't know who they are. I wish I did. I don't live there. So I'm just giving off my vibes. But uh, to you, a seasoned investigator, is there the possibility in your mind until it's absolutely been ruled out that there could have been two killers? Absolutely. You can't rule it out at all. And it comes back to that tunnel vision versus open mind. Um, in a way, I can understand why she feels that way. And I'm sure a lot of people do, because it goes back to what our brain and how we're processing it, thinking, how can you go and kill two people in one room? Nobody hears anything. And then you go across the hall. I don't know the layout of the apartment and you kill another two people and yet nobody knows. So that logically makes sense. Um, but again, we're not dealing with logic here, right? So um, I don't think you can say yes or no that you have one killer or two uh, at this stage. Next question um, from Pam Merrigan, talking about the Moscow police chief. The police chief is fine. He knows his community and he knows the people. Data didn't kill these kids. A person killed these kids. This is a small town with a university. The police chief is uniquely qualified to solve this crime and keep his community safe. He knows the gossip. He knows the usual suspect. He knows the loyalties. He knows the geography. So again, Lisa, to you, we, we hear criticism of the local police chief, but Pam brings up some interesting points that the local police chief is going to know a lot of things and a lot of people connected to the community that let's say the FBI doesn't, right? Absolutely. And, and so the chief, and his officers know the community um, and they have relationships with the community. And so, yes, they know a lot of the players in the community, but if we go and we get tunnel vision again, you're looking at just the community. Uh, being open-minded, which I know they're doing, you're looking outside the community as well, because you have to. Um, and so, yes, nobody knows the community better than the police department, including obviously the police chief. So you have to rely on that um, because of the relationships that are there. And people are going to be comfortable talking to people they know. The FBI, and I'm sure they're doing this, they're, provide, they're a strong support for the Moscow Police Department. So back to doing the victimology, who our victims are, and, and analyzing data and, and cell phones and videos, that's what the FBI is helping do, you know, to do. And all these interviews that are coming in, they're experts at it as well. Um, so, you know, you have to maintain that. And at the same time, something that sometimes we forget about, he still has a town that he and his officers have to patrol and deal with. On top of the constant calls that are coming in of people that see something suspicious, the community is on edge and they're going to be on edge until an arrest is made. And that makes perfect sense. Um, another one who comes, come, this one comes from a user with a lot of letters once again. 
Uh, this I might be putting you both on the spot, and I apologize because it's not an easy question to answer. But early on, uh, the Moscow uh, police chief talked about, quote unquote, patterns found. And this person wants to know what could he be talking about? Uh, Lisa, do you have any idea or let's start with Lisa and then ask Robin about uh, these patterns that were allegedly being found? So when I think patterns, I think forensically. Um, so I think footwear, fingerprint, transfer nice. evidence. Um, that's what I think immediately, but that's the way my brain works. So typically when, when those of us in the law enforcement community say patterns, that is a forensic side. However, there could be other patterns that pertain to the victimology, um, behavioral patterns, uh, digital social media patterns, you know, so again, kind of a broad term and without knowing the full context on, on what that was being referred to, it's really hard to hone in on what pattern specifically the chief was referring to. And to you, Robin, when you think of patterns from a behavioral standpoint, what are you thinking of? Um, along the same lines of forensics, I'm going to the patterns of how the, uh, the four people died. So if you had two different individuals that they think committed the crime, then you're going to have two different types of stab wounds because no two people are going to kill the same way. Um, so I, I look for patterns of how they died. Interesting. So you're saying killers are like snowflakes. No two killers will kill the same. It They were going to have their own uniqueness to it um, that is going to establish a pattern. Wow. That's interesting. I never thought of that. See what you, until you brought it up. <laughs> well, yeah. well, when you say patterns, well, you say what popped in my mind. That's exactly what popped in my mind is it's, it's kind of like, you know, when you're analyzing um, rounds being shot, you can tell what gun it came from, even though it's the same mm -hmm. bullet. Well, every, every muzzle has a different, you know, pattern to it and a way to identify it. Same thing with, if you have two different knives, if you have two different uh, killers, you're going to see different patterns. Very interesting. I'll have you guys both weigh in. This is the last question, then we'll get the final word, and then we will wrap it up. This one comes from Sicily, New York, a Sicilian problem here. Everyone is living in an instant society and in TV land. This ain't no scripted TV show that solves crimes in 60 minutes with five commercial breaks. Too many true crime goofballs hosting. I guess he's talking about me and following them. Uh, um, Lisa, to you. Does Sicily, New York bring up a good point? This is not a TV show. This is reality. I mean, we're 44 days in. Um, does any of this surprise you at this point in terms not of at all. the time? Not at all. Um, I, again, you know, it's tough. It, it's, you know, there's so many high profile murders that have occurred. Um, and our reporters, our podcasts, our news, you name it. Um, in a lot of ways are lifelines uh, and you never know what somebody's gonna hear. And, and so, you know, 44 days, given the magnitude of this case, isn't, um, you all would love to have a rest in 48 hours, but I don't think it's unrealistic. It's a, it's a massive case um, and there's a lot of questions. But again, we only know what we know from what's been released. And Robin, you come from the uh, naval world. The only TV show I know is NCIS that relates mm -hmm. to Navy, but this is not an episode of NCIS, right? This is uh, a lot of twists and turns, a lot of human behavior you've got to examine. How is uh, true crime different from TV crime? I think everyone's seeing it right here. As Lisa was saying, this is playing out pretty much exactly as you would imagine in real life as it does. It takes time to conduct that many interviews. You look at the number of people that are working on the case and you look at the number of people that are in this community, as well as you look at the venue that the killer chose with the number of people in and out of that house. This, there's a lot of work to be done that still needs to be done. And I think the bottom line to always understand with all this is you have a lot of dedicated people that are that are doing everything humanly possible they can to solve this to Absolutely. bring and always un, always know no one is taking half measures anywhere they're all doing the best they can with what they have and support it because if you don't it's it's not going to solve as fast so that's that's it but i think it's going as fast as it can go 
And I think you sort of just did it, but I'd love to give you a final word, anything you'd like to add on to, or, you know, anything to look out for that you're looking out for, or which direction you think we might be headed in right now. Just my heart still goes out to the families and everyone affected by this, as well as the families of all the law enforcement working this. It is a grueling, horrendous process that they're all losing a lot. Everyone's losing a lot over this. And I just hope it comes to a conclusion that everyone's looking for where someone is brought to justice soon. Lisa? It's just remember, everybody, that all you know is what's being released. There's so much more information that we don't know. So keep an open mind, trust all the law enforcement agencies that are working on this case and everybody that's involved in it across the country, not just in the state, and, and be patient. Um, and don't be quick to criticize those that are working the case, because again, we only know a small amount of information on the case itself. So I've done a lot in my career. I've had the good fortune. I was a beat reporter. I covered... Uh politics for a lot of years but the reason i think i love this so much is because of you guys the guests are uh truly fascinating um we've got lisa daddio i love the last name she is a retired police lieutenant with the new haven police department she spent 16 years in the detective division in all kinds of roles including the major crimes unit processing over 200 crime scenes ranging from vandalism to homicides and uh, went on to get her. You got your master's in social work. Now you're moving into the uh, Robin Dreek side of things or what? <laughs> master's in social work and forensic science. I have a double. So, uh, yeah. And you went and did that after you retired? Uh, no, I had my master's in forensics. Right the day I graduated the day before I started the police academy. And I got my MSW actually about uh, halfway through my career because I thought I was going to do a different uh, change. And instead, I did my 20 years with the incredible city of New Haven uh, in Connecticut, and I've been teaching in higher education ever since. Amazing. And then you've got Robin Dreek. The list is so long, but I'll do it again. A best-selling author, a professional speaker, a trainer, executive coach, podcast host, Marine Corps officer, and retired FBI special agent. He was the chief of the counterintelligence behavior analysis program. Robin, what is the name of the podcast? Forged by Trust. <laughs> Forged by Trust. Watch it, check it out, but make sure you still watch mine. He's also <laughs> the author of The Code of Trust, and it's not all about me. I'm going to buy that book just so I can give it to my mother. Hopefully, Robin will sign it uh, for me so I can hand it off to my mom, who will make fun of me because she always says it's all about me, which it's really not. But listen, don't you worry. We'll be back soon enough with another episode of Surviving the Survivor. Love you, America.